Hi there everybody, now this blog always was and probably always will be to do with the subject of off-grid uh, with some overlapping with self-sufficiency. I mean the, the, the two terms self-sufficiency and off-grid basically mean two different things. I know various different groups have uh, retranslated the words to mean different things but essentially they they roughly mean different classifications. Self-sufficiency is more to do with growing your own fruit and vegetables and uh, raising rabbits for meat and all the rest of that. Off-grid just means doing without electric water and gas from the mains. But think about when you're going through your day, uh, how you use your power and your water and your gas and your electric. And think about which substitutions you want to make and what technology you would use to substitute them. I mean, right now, this is the end of November. It's getting a bit chilly. Winter, or the first day of winter being December the 1st, is about to start. Uh, hmm. Is this an ideal time to think closely about what variety of off-grid technology one can use? Well, first thing in the morning, I would want to normally turn the heating up. Uh, that, of course, would have to be got rid of. I'd probably have to get straight out of bed, straight into... Uh, winter woolens of various different types or thermal clothing. Typically speaking, I want to make myself some breakfast immediately after that, which would either mean the use of the popcorn maker or the use of my hobs, because, or indeed the microwave, depending upon whether I'm making um, popcorn to mush up and use as a cereal, or whether I want to make pancakes or whether I want to use the microwave and make myself some oatmeal. Now, if I turned off the electric, uh, I could use a camping gas stove, because that's still an off-grid technology. You're going to a shop to buy the gas to bring it in to your house so that you can then use it, but it's still off-grid. Right? It's off-grid, but it's still a technology you have to go out and buy. That's one possibility. Or alternatively, you could use a wood gas stove outside uh, and just use basically brushwood and sticks that you collected when you were going for a walk as the fuel if the wood gas stove was large enough. One gallon wood gas stoves is much better for twigs. The um, food can size that I've been showing you in the past, that's much better for wood pellets which have a calorific value similar to that of coal. Okay, it, it, you know, important thing to learn. Uh, you could have like a 16 brick rocket stove that would be a good thing, have uh, a couple of those, maybe four or five of those put up in the garden already so that you can just go outside and start using it straight away provided the course it's dry enough and it hasn't rained all over it maybe you could actually have a, a covered area for your rocket stoves so you can go outside into the, into the cold basically start a couple of outdoor fires and use the gasification technology of the rocket stove and see basically what you can do What else? Well, you want to make yourself a nice cup of tea, or at least I do. I'm addicted to the damn thing. So you could have yourself a Kelly kettle. Now these um, these are powered by twigs. You put a nest of twigs inside them and underneath, set fire to them. The flame shoots up the middle, thus heating the water from a chimney in the middle. Okay, and you can also get little cooking attachments to fit on top of them if they're large enough. Kelly kettles, and you can use that to cook with as well as to boil your water. What you could, of course, do is prepare yourself some boiling water the previous night. Use the boiled water in a hay box system to cook your oatmeal overnight. So you can have oatmeal first thing in the morning without having to do any cooking. That would be an interesting way of doing it, using um, hay boxes as, as a slow cooker. Alright, so... This is just a breakfast time so far, and we haven't yet covered the difficulties of shaving and bathing. Because you'd have to have sufficient energy to be able to boil the water. You'd want to be able to do it in a warm building, because otherwise, you know, getting out of uh, a bath into freezing cold air, let's say, you know, winter's really coming down and we've got temperatures of like minus 20 Celsius, would you really want to bathe and then get into freezing cold air? Probably not. Probably would be bad for your health. I mean, in the old, old days, people used to wear 
uh, long johns and long sleeve vests and they would just get sewn into it around the waist. Now if obviously for all their toilet functions they would have to unbutton a door um, to, you, to have access to that part of the body basically. But they were just sewn into their long sleeved vests and long, uh, and long johns. They did not wash in the old, 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 old days. But we don't want to have to go back that far. We live in the 21st century, so you still got to think about uh, washing all your clothes, as well as making sure that you can wash your body as well. And that means a lot of energy. So where's the energy going to come from? Well, you can have a wood stove. Wood stoves are good because they provide a lot of radiant heat and they are therefore very good to keep your house warm. You only need quite a small wood stove in your, in your house to be able to provide the energy that you require. You can get some similar designs which are there for diesel or biodiesel, but on the other hand, biodiesel would smell bad. You can get paraffin fueled heaters as well. If you could get sufficient ventilation, the biodiesel one would be preferable. The reason why it would be preferable is because you can make biodiesel. You can go around all of your local restaurants and say, look, I want to take your used vegetable oil off you so that I can recycle it. And you can get jerry can after jerry can after jerry can of stinky, horrid, unpleasant, undesirable used vegetable oil. And you can process that back at home if you get the... Uh, KOH I think it is, or a similar form of um, alkali. I don't know which one it is, I think it's KOH. Uh, as well as a few other things, a few other chemicals and enough equipment to be able to titrate and make your own biodiesel. That's still a cash expense to get the equipment, even though you'll be trying to get free fuel or cheap fuel anyway. All right, so that's that's a curiosity. You could adjust one of those stoves with the help of a coil if you were to design it well enough. Uh, and then gravity feeds water through the coil straight into the bathtub. So the fire or the um, biodiesel would then heat the water in the coil thus providing you with enough hot water for a bath. So it, it's doable. So that would heat your, heat your room so you've got a nice warm room to get into once you had your bath and it would heat the water in your bath. A lot of changes would have to be made to your property to allow the uh, proper venting of the biodiesel, uh, smoke and fumes and through a chimney systems out of the wall, possibly even having an electric fan blow which would have to be powered via a battery which would have to be charged by your solar which would have to be separate to make sure it all goes out, basically. But the design is doable. As far as shaving is concerned, either, you know, just use razor blades or you can have your electric shaver, which could be rechargeable via a 12 volt system. Okay. You could have copper pipes on your walls, one of them labeled positive, one of them labeled negative, and just use those positive and negative terminals and have a clip system, just clip your positive and negatives onto that, and that can go onto uh, a portable cigarette lighter type socket, and you can use that for lighting or any other 12 volt appliance that you might want to use. These things can be doable. So, right now what we've discussed in the first nine minutes of this video is the fact that, yeah, you can, you, you can go off grid and I've discussed what you can do just to take you to the point whereby you've had your breakfast and you've had your bath. Now, the discussion can go on and on and on about whether you would use lighting during the day, what if it's a really, really grey day and you want to use extra lighting, well, you might want to, but on the other hand, that's an energy expense. I mean, being off-grid is just turning everything off. Anyone can do that. Anyone can basically go off-grid if they've got the ability to turn everything off. But it's what you're going to substitute and how you're going to do it. That's really the question. And no, off-grid does not mean free fuel or free power. All right, The solar panels I made, they were not free. They were, you know, I accumulated bits here, there and everywhere, bit by bit by bit. Because I'm doing this on a low income but high cash flow type lifestyle. 
So that's how I can get bits together. Like one month I buy the cells, one month I get the wood, one month I get the plastic, one month, you know, and so on and so forth. Or one week I get this, or one week I get that. Now, if you're approaching December the 21st and you've got some really heavy overcast cast days, you're going to want to have some light no matter what. You're going to want to really cheer yourself up. One of the best technological solutions would have to be LEDs. Just wait a second. I know it's just a torch, but you can get the impression from that the single LED bulb can actually put out quite a lot of power. And they use very little electricity. So, you know how to design a massive cluster of the bulbs so that you can get enough broad illumination and a, a sufficiently low enough wattage. Uh, to be practical and feasible for your off-grid location. And you've got to think about the power for that. So that involves your wind power, that involves your solar, that involves a bicycle generator, which you might want to spend like an hour on every couple of nights just to keep your batteries topped up. If you were to generate 100 watt hours and you've got yourself um, a light which works on 5, five watts, let's say, you got yourself 200 hours worth of one light being on. So you've got two of them, that's 100 hours worth based upon one hour's worth of cycling. Provided, of course, you've got your electricals sorted out, your electronics right. So, you can do these things. What about cheering yourself up? I mean, anyone can just sit in a cold, empty flat with no lights on and no heating, freezing, if you want it. No one wants that, do they? No, we want to have warmth. We want to have entertainment because essentially these days it's the thing which you need to have. You need to be aware of what's happening in the world, and also you need to be given a bit, you know, a bit of a buzz, something to keep yourself going, uh, as well as communicating with other people, and that will therefore mean something like your internet. Uh, you might be able to get some form of internet ent uh, entertainment from remote devices such as a good quality mobile phone, all right? But even that will have a cash expense. You could recharge them off a 12 volt system, so the, and the power will be negligible by comparison with the, a computer. So again, you could hypothetically do that. That could provide you with radio broadcast via BBC iPlayer um, and so on and so forth. So, there's ways and there's means to do it. And I think it has to be, you know, a bit of a DIY fanatic to be able to make sure you can make all these things happen. So, it, what is it that you want to substitute? Is it your cooking technology? Is it your lighting technology? Your lighting is probably the first thing that you could do. Right, obviously it hasn't been for myself in doing this, this particular video blog because I've been working on all kinds of other things. I wanted to show you the solar, I wanted to show you how it's done um, to demonstrate that people can just make energy. But you can use your solar uh, if you get a good enough system sorted out, uh, good, good quality 12 volt lighting, 12 volt batteries, the ability to charge it all up. Yeah, you can replace your lighting. But you'll still need your supplementary power via a bicycle generator and or uh, wind power to be able to make sure you're generating enough power to be able to completely substitute that. Alternatively, you could just use wind-up lanterns and wind-up torches. Okay. I actually did. It was a couple of winters ago when I first bought this torch. And I spent one night, one whole night and a day just using this torch to illuminate everything. So if I wanted ambient lights, I made a coat of paper and I put it around the top. Okay, so I could turn it on and the light would come out and it would diffuse through the cone of paper. And that would provide me with a gentle ambient light, which was quite good. Of course, directional, dead simple. And also this style of torch has got an extra accessory output and you can use the power within the torch to power a little headlamp which you can use for reading in bed at night. So 
there are ways. I mean, this is this is just a wind up. This is a wind up torch. Trevor Bayless design. There's things which you can buy off the counter now, which if you were really fastidious about and sufficiently fastidious about right now, you could use to take yourself off grid. I mean. Uh, sure, when I'm filming right now, I need to have that light on so you can see me. I need to have the computer on so I can get the video uploaded. Alright? I need to have lights on to provide some ambient light so I basically look okay on, on camera. Uh, so I do need to use up some energy when making this particular video. But, there's nothing saying that I shouldn't just turn everything off afterwards. I mean, everything off at the main sockets, completely. Alright? and just rely upon this for my illumination just rely upon my mobile phone for a bit of um, YouTube entertainment okay. and radio as long as I can plug it into a 12 volt socket on a battery system to you know keep myself part of the world There's, there is ways of doing it you have to sacrifice a lot you have to think about what you're sacrificing uh, and you've got to be willing to do it. And there's numerous reasons, I think, for people to show an interest. I mean, the off-grid community, the, uh, the homesteading community, the disaster preparedness community, it, it, it all overlaps tremendously. And the technologies and ideas that people in these various different communities, also the green and environmental and energy saving and all these, uh, all these ideological communities, um, overlaps like crazy. So, you know, you can research very broadly to what you're interested in uh, and to try and work out what you want to make happen. Now, I had this conversation um, a little while ago. I just went out to see some friends. There was this guy there who I hadn't spoken to before. And I says, hi, how's it going? My name's Nick, and blah, 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 blah. You know, you know the way it is. And he tells me what he does for a living. And he turns out he's an electrical engineer, and he works for the power grid. And he says, well, come 2016, things are going to get real bad. And I says, well, why is that? And he says, well, one of your power stations is closing down. I thought, ah, oh, right, one of the local ones from my area is closing down. Right, okay. He says, well, what else can you tell me? And he just went on and on and on about grid fragility and about the fact that there's plans or ideas in this country to try and make grid electricity get so expensive that everyone has to start getting solar because it's going to be more or less, you know, the same kind of like price and people are going to be more willing uh, to invest in alternative technologies. Um, and for those who are too lazy, well, they're just going to have to pay lots of extra money, aren't they? And it's all going to get very difficult. And also there's a bit of a glut for the techno technology for nuclear at the moment. So that's a big problem for the nation as well. And also there's um, the auxiliary power supplies have got problems as well for when the winter comes. Uh, so, you know, the grid in the UK realistically is very fragile anyway at the best of times. And it's about to get a lot more fragile and the power is about to get a lot more expensive. So, f for me, one of the reasons to uh, progress towards off-grid is that there's going to come a time when I'm not going to be able to afford it. You know, we are running out of oil. Um, and we've got to cover other aspects of quality of life. And this is one of the things I want for myself, but I want to take all of you people along with me. Okay, if you get my drift. We can do it, you know, we, we can all learn how to melt wax and make candles if necessary. We can make those wonderful olive oil lanterns that I showed you how to do, how to make. We can do these things if we really want. I've had, uh, I've taken my baths by the light of those oil, uh, olive oil lamps, which is beautiful, okay? And they're actually quite bright, so you don't need more than two or three in your bathroom to be able to give you sufficient illumination for all, you know, all of your tasks. And you don't need more than two or three in a room of this size to be able to give you the basic illumination. Okay, it's still a bit gloomy, but it's, it's the basic illumination that you need and it doesn't cost the earth. 
okay for long term usage all night usage maybe it'll be a bit difficult so maybe you want to have like one of those and maybe half a dozen tea lights as well just to keep the ambient light going as well as having as many uh, wind up illumination devices at hand for when you need that extra boost okay there's ways of doing it using electricity there's ways of doing it without using electricity but it's all things to to be interested in and to plan and to prepare for are you doing this for need are you doing this to provide yourself with the same standard of life that you would have if you had ample electricity and it was all free because if that's the case that's never going to happen Okay. And also, there are people here in the Western world who can't afford to turn the heating up to keep warm. Okay, obviously, you can tell today I've got two jumpers on because, you know, I'm conscious of the cost. But there are people who are getting sick and, and potentially dying because they can't afford the energy. So ways around this and trying to fit it into your standard domestic setting is, is going to become essential. Could you use something like bicycle generators to supplement your heating? No, you couldn't. No way. Apart from, of course, you, you get hot when doing physical exercise. But no, you couldn't use that to warm yourself up when the temperature outside is minus 20. Hmm. There's lots of difficulties facing the world right now. From your point of view, just research the technologies you want to use. Research the things that, research the things you want to replace. And work out how badly you want to go off grid. If you decide that it's too much of a chore, try and use the technology or the ideas that will make life a little easier. Like, let's say, just use your rocket stoves in the, in the late spring and summer, for instance. Uh, use your Kelly kettle when the weather's not too bad. Little things like that. Build yourself some solar and just have a grid tie inverter. So it's essentially that can do its stuff without you having to touch it. So it'll be cutting down your bills just by a little. Okay? Make sure, of course, you get permission from your electric company to use a grid tie inverter. Tell them the wattage you're putting out and all the rest of that. And make sure it fits in with their plans because you don't want to cause a brownout. Also think about the ways in which you're using energy now. And what you could actually do without comfortably. It just takes a bit of planning. Anyway, there's lots more I could say, but I'm just going to leave it at that for now. God bless.